morning. Okay, so here is your um, Moodle page. So I put a new section, pre-anesthetic medications. Um, this PowerPoint that we're gonna start goes over all of the anesthetic medications, but I break them down into pre-anesthetics and then we'll do induction and inhalants. Um, and then we kind of end with anesthetic machines. That's about what I can get through in anesthesia one. Sometimes some of the machines I have to bump to the very beginning of anesthesia two, but we'll see how we do. Um, but I do break it up um, into sections. And what I, have, what I haven't put on here is I will give you a list of the medications that you'll be responsible for uh, for this section. Um, the homework I loaded, let me actually see if I can pull it up, if it's going to cooperate today. See if my computer is going to be nice to me. Uh, where did it go? Nope. Uh, okay. Hold on. Okay, there it is. It popped on. Um, Okay, let me scooch it over here. Ah, computer. Com okay, um, so let me explain what this um, looks like. So, um, so this vocabulary you do not need to do. So it says that at the top, but those terms are gonna be used when we talk about the drugs and you know potentially i could use them on the test in a question so just being familiar with these type of terms um, there are some questions these are general questions about pre-anesthetics uh, like the pre-meds and the adjuncts um, and then um, okay they are added here okay perfect um, so first of all you would answer these questions numbers one through nine and then we need to write up the drugs. Now, how you do this, I do not care. So some people, um, I know sometimes Gillis in pharmacology, um, you know, you guys would fill out drug charts. If you want to write them out in a drug chart, or if you just want to list them and answer these questions about each of the drugs, you know, in just like a line form, like some people put, you know, first drug, answer everything, second drug, that's totally fine. But for each drug, you'll have to say like, um, first of all, I usually break the drugs into categories. Like for example, anticholinergics are a group of adjuncts. So first of all, why would we use this category of drug? And then, there will be drugs that are in that category. For example, there's atropine and glycopyrrolate. So then how many drugs are in the category? And then for each individual drug, you know, indications, when we talk about indications, why are we giving, you know, this medication to, you know, to treat? Species that could be used in, um, sometimes they're gonna be used in all species, sometimes we don't use them in all species. Um, any side effects? So now let me talk about the difference between a contraindication and a side effect. When a drug has a contraindication, you know, we don't use it in this species because of this. A side effect means you gave it. Now these are, you know, things that happened because we gave that drug. You know, we caused a side effect. So sometimes people get confused, and hopefully you guys. Did you guys get a plum drug handbook, that big, huge drug? We yes, did. we did. That is like the Amen Bible, should have everything you need. I really, and I'm going to say this, and hopefully everybody that's here is listening to me, I don't want you to Google these drugs. And the problem is, sometimes when people write up these drugs, they'll give me a human trade name, or they'll give me some human um, I can t I can tell the difference. I'm like that's from a human website. So the the things that you can use, obviously, you know, your textbook is going to have some information. Your plum, I mean, that should be all you need. Um, if you do look it up, there was that vasg.org website, 
And that also has good drug information. That's the only sources I would use. I mean, sometimes it's easy to Google, but I'm going to take points off if I get human information. So I have taken points off because people gave me wrong names of drugs. So as long as you use those three sources, you should be able to do everything you need. Um, and then some of these questions will be very short. Does it have a reversal agent? That's a yes or no question. Um, does it have analgesic properties? That's a yes or no question. So it's not like, you know, there's a novel. So the drugs that we're going to be, you know, so here I've done part of the work for you. The anticholinergics are atropine and glycopyrrolate. The phenothiazines, we're only going to talk about acepromazine. The alpha-2 agonists, we're going to do xylazine and dextomator. Alpha-2 antagonists, which are the reversals, are yohimbine and adipamazole. And then the anticonvulsants are midazolam and diazepam. Now, I did add opioids to this. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about opioids when we do pain management next term. But because the opioids are used a lot of times in the pre-anesthetic period, I wanted to introduce them as pre-anesthetics. But then... I broke down the ones you need to know. So these are the drugs right here that need to be written up. Now, the other thing I added is you don't have to write up atropine. I wrote it up for you as an example to give you an idea of like if I was doing this, because I will admit when you look at Plum, there's a lot of information in there. And I'm kind of looking for just the very common things that are going to apply to anesthesia. Um, so this is, I kind of want you to use this as your guide. So all I did was write drug, atropine sulfate. There is no trade name different. So it pretty much any company that makes atropine just calls it atropine. Well, there is one called Atroject, but I mean, for the most part, you know, but for example, when you guys do, well, Dex Domator is the trade name dexmedetomidine is the generic name. So you'll have to write the trade and the generic. Um, it belongs in the anticholinergic category, which is its family. And then indications or, you know, why do we use it in anesthesia? In anesthesia to prevent um, or reduce secretions like salivary secretions, treat bradycardia or sinoatrial arrest. Um, AV block, hypersialism, you know. So when you look it up, there might be a, like a whole bunch of different reasons you can give this drug. I only want to know why we're using it for anesthesia. And you don't have, you know, just a couple, three things. Contraindications. So is there anybody that should not get this drug? Well, if you have a patient with glaucoma, it's, you know, it can raise ocular pressure. Glaucoma they already have increased ocular pressure. We don't want to make it worse. So if your patient has glaucoma, they probably shouldn't get this drug. Um, GI obstruction, because atropine can actually slow down the GI tract. Well, if we're trying to help move an obstruction through, it's not going to help. Um, if they have a known hypersensitivity. Now, you don't always know that going into it sometimes but we might you know say i did surgery on a dog last year or i helped with anesthesia i gave atropine and he went way tachycardic i could put that in his record and then he comes in for a dental i can be like oh last year we gave atropine and he probably shouldn't get it again so there may be cases where in the history you do know they were sensitive to it um and then it's contraindicated in rabbits because of their atropinesterase. Um, and I'll make a, just a quick statement about that. You can give atropine to a rabbit. The thing is, is it may not be effective because of that enzyme will break down the drug before it can take effect. So it's not, you know, you can give it. And, and, and I will say anytime... I say, for example, in atropine, anytime I say we're not going to give it, if the animal goes into cardiac arrest, because atropine is one of our number one CPR drugs, you're going to give it. I mean, because, you know, if I had a rabbit that was dying, I mean, there's a 30, you know, there's like a 70% chance it might work, a 30% chance it might not, you know. So there, be, there will be times, you know, with a drug like atropine being a CPR drug, 
you know, there's going to be times where we may just have to give it. But um, then it can be used in all species, any side effects. So, you know, dry mouth, constipation, drowsiness, ataxia, tachycardia, uh, bradycardia after initial dose. So these are all things that will happen after you give it that can happen in patients that these aren't the effects we want that just sometimes happens when we give this drug. So these would be things like when I use atropine, I'm always aware of the side effects, you know, so I can look for, you know, if it happens in this patient. It is not reversible and it has no analgesia. So you can see um, that this drug, that's all I really wanted. You know, I want like the top two or three reasons, you know, that we shouldn't give it, or, you know, the two or three main side effects, which some of that I'll go over in lecture, but your plum book is really where you're gonna get your information. Um, this is a guide, um, but whenever you look up these drugs, I want you to focus on things. Sometimes people will tell me things about a drug, like for example, diazepam. Diazepam's primary use is an anticonvulsant, it treats seizures, and someone might write it's used to treat seizures. That's if from a neurologic standpoint. Why do we use it in anesthesia? It's a, it's a sedative, and it also um, is anesthetic sparing. If we give it, it decreases the dose, you know, and causes muscle relaxation. So you see, I know, I mean, I know, it's an anti-seizure medication, but why am I using it for anesthesia? So I kind of wanted to spend some time, you know, I'm gonna get into some of this stuff during lecture, um, but I wanted this due next Thursday, so maybe we could potentially review it that day and have the midterm on Friday potentially. So that's kind of my goal. Um, so this is the homework. And again, you don't have to do atropine because I've written it up and I would use this as your example. So you see the drugs you're responsible for. Um, this just explains for what I want for each category. But again, use, use this one as your example. And then don't forget about, these are kind of general questions about pre-anesthetics. Um, that's part of the homework. And again, you do not need to do the vocabulary. Just being familiar with these terms. Okay, are there any questions about that? Okay. You know, if in... Okay, let's see if this wants to... Okay, so let's go ahead, um, and this, like, so again, chapter three, and I, I will give you the number of the slide where we stop. Again, this PowerPoint we'll use for the next two, two or so weeks. It'll be this PowerPoint for the other drugs. We just, I just break them up into sections. But I do wanna talk about an anesthetic agent. It's the drug that will, you know, it'll cause either a loss of consciousness, or a loss of sensation. Now remember, sedation versus general anesthesia. All of the pre-anesthetics that I'm talking about, none of these drugs are putting our patient under general anesthesia. These are all your sedative slash tranquilizers. And some of these drugs, which mainly atropine and glyco, are considered adjunct drugs. Now, it those drugs are not an anesthetic, but we use them with our anesthetic agents to either like pre-treat because of an effect, um, you know, because of a side effect, because of a, you know, a contraindication, enhance analgesia. So some of these drugs are considered, you know, as I cover them, I'll tell you which ones are anesthetic and which ones are considered adjuncts. Um, now, when we talk about anesthetic agents, how do we classify them? As I go over different drugs, sometimes they're classified on how we give them, what route. So for example, when I talk about isoflurane, 
that's considered an inhalant anesthetic because it has to be de delivered via inhalation. Um, sometimes there's topical anesthetics, like you can use lidocaine topically. And so sometimes people will classify it as a topical agent. Now, the majority of the drugs in this section um, are just considered injectables, meaning we can either give them IM, IV, sub-Q. Some of these drugs you can give epidurally, which is an adjunct technique. Um, sometimes you can give these drugs peritoneally, like if you're gonna do a mouse or a rat, sometimes these anesthetics are injected in the abdomen and it's absorbed within the abdominal cavity. So that's like an IP. For the most part, for your average everyday patient, I'm really focusing on IM, IV, sub Q. Some of these drugs can, give in, can be given orally. Now, transtracheal is not as common. Sometimes we do that in CPR, like if you can't get an IV in a patient. Sometimes you can squirt the rescue drugs down the trachea and it gets absorbed into the blood, um, the capillaries and the lungs, and you can use it that way. I mean, that's not ideal, but if you can't hit an IV, you don't have a lot of options. Um, but I will tell you like buprenorphine that we're gonna talk about, um, it's a pre-anesthetic slash analgesic, but we use it a lot post-operatively in cats and you can give it bucally or sublingual. And it's equally absorbed as if you gave it sub-Q, which it's nice because we can send it home with owners because not many owners are gonna wanna give their cat an injection, but you can open their mouth and just, not with a needle, you take off the needle, you just squirt it under their tongue and they absorb it. And so some of these medications, you can also do um, buccal ACE, I have a friend, her dog has storm anxiety, and uh, she just draws up a little amount of ACE and gives it under his tongue. And so some of these drugs, we've got different routes. I'll always talk about the most common, but some other routes. Sometimes, and, and, and what I'm really focusing on right now is talking about agents and when you give them. I'm focusing first on the pre-anesthetics because all of these medications are given in the pre-anesthetic or before general anesthesia. So we're giving them as pre-meds. Um, the next group we will talk about are the induction agents, which are inducing a state of general anesthesia, propofol, ketamine valium, <coughs> alfaxin. So those drugs have to be given um, induction. And then I talk about the maintenance agents, which are typically your inhalants, but those are the drugs that keep them asleep, keep them asleep for the surgery. Because a lot of your injectables will wear off and you know, you're just gonna have your isoflurane on board, but it's a maintenance slash inhalant. And then some of these drugs that are, I'm gonna talk about pre-anesthetically, we can also give post-operatively. I can give ACE post-op if the dog is like screaming and crazy. I can give buprenorphine or you know, post-op for an injection for pain. So a lot of the pre-anesthetics can also be used during recovery, post-op and like that first 24 hours. And again, I will talk about those, but we will focus on pain management, I guess, you know, in anesthesia too. So I'll kind of revisit some of that. You can also talk about, you know, when we talk about anesthetics, are they a local, or are they general? You know, so if it's a local anesthetic agent, you're giving it in one area. And it, you know, like locals are pretty much your like lidocaine, they're your numbing agents that are, they're considered local anesthetics. Now, when I talk about a general anesthetic, then it affects the entire body. It affects the brain, cardio, respiratory, and gives us the general effect. Um, and then I'll talk about the way this is important for this section. I'm going to talk about sedatives and tranquilizers versus analgesics. One thing that I will hammer home to you, and I've kind of introduced it to you because I was talking about your radiology patients. Anytime you give your dog, your patient, like a group of drugs, like you say you gave atropine, dextomator, and butorphanol. Each drug has multiple effects, 
but there's always a main job and a main reason you're giving each drug. And that's what I tried. It's like, I think it was an extra credit question on your first test. It was like, Dextomator is a sedative. Now, does it have analgesia? Yes, that's a nice little side effect. Butorphanol is primarily an analgesic. Do you get some sedation? Yep, but the main reason I'm giving it is for analgesia. And then atropine has no analgesic effects. It has no uh, sedative effects. It's an adjunct and it's treating the bradycardia that may come with the dextomator. So you see each, each drug that you give an animal has a main job. And then we'll talk about the other things it does. But that's, you know, so when I'm going to talk about the drugs that do these things, um, I won't get too much into neuromuscular blockers. That gets when you get into optosurgery, but you can get uh, neuromuscular blockade. It, they're, they're paralytic agents. Um, but there's anticholinergics and reversals. So I'll go over all those categories. And then sometimes we talk about their chemistry. Um, you know, there's a little note here under the gray box. Um, you know, when we talk about adjuncts and anesthetics and how they bind to receptors, that's kind of getting into the chemistry. I mean, there's, I don't get too in depth in it, but I'll talk about how they work together, so to speak. You'll hear me use the term agonist, antagonist, partial. Really the only time, well, I talk about this a little bit with the alpha 2s because the drugs you use are called alpha 2 agonists. Anytime a drug is an agonist or agonizing, it's going to bind to a target and stimulate that. So really, an agonist needs a receptor. So when you give an agonist, like it's easier, let me talk about opioids. When we get to opioids, there are opioid receptors and there's different types of opioid receptors. Usually when a, a drug is called an, a pure agonist, it means when you give that drug, it's going to go to those opioid receptors equally most of the time and bind and it's gonna stimulate all those receptors. Um, and most of our agents and adjuncts are agonists. Now, I will talk about antagonists because that's the reversal. It goes to the target. The way I think of it is like it knocks off the drug, it binds to the target, but then it doesn't cause the effect. So in a sense, it reverses them. So antagonists are typically your reversal agents. I don't know if you guys, I mean, if you follow things and you know about the opioid crisis, um, you know, if, if people have overdosed on heroin, a lot of police departments and, you know, paramedics carry Narcan or Naloxone. Naloxone is a pure opioid antagonist. So it will bind to those receptors and reverse the effects, hopefully in time of the overdose. So we use, we have naloxone or Narcan in our hospital. So if we give an animal too much morphine or too much fentanyl, uh, we can reverse them, you know? So it's the same drug that the police departments and people carry for, you know, the opioid overdoses. But your antagonists, and I will tell you, that's why it's a category on your drugs, is you need to know which drugs have an antagonist or a reversal agent available, because not all anesthetics are reversible. So I will talk about which ones are reversible, and then you'll need to know what is the reversal agent. Now, when you get into, and this is continuing with opioid, opioids, they have what's called partial agonists and drugs that are called agonist antagonists. Like butorphanol is technically an agonist antagonist, meaning it, when you give butorphanol, it will go to some of the opioid receptors, bind and cause that effect, and it will go to certain opioid receptors and block those effects. So the partial agonists and the agonist antagonists are not as potent opioids. You know, like if I have a dog, you know, that comes in with a fractured femur, like hit by car, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not 
going to get as good of analgesia if we give more if we give butorphanol or buprenorphine. When you have heavy trauma, you want to go with your big hitters: hydromorphone, fentanyl, morphine. Those because those are pure agonists; they bind to all the receptors, and you're going to get much better pain relief. Now, your these drugs are going to get you know bind to some receptors and give you some analgesia. I mean, they're better than nothing, um, but they're not our heavy hitters for pain because they don't go to all the receptors. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, sometimes you give one drug and then you want to give another drug. Well, what happens, especially in ER and in when I worked in referral surgery, is sometimes a dog will go to another clinic and they'll give them butorphanol. So they might not have morphine. Well, then they come to us and we want to use morphine. Well, if they've been given this partial agonist, we can get some competition because we've got some antagonist with butorphanol, and I want to give a full agonist. So I'm going to talk about like receptor binding and receptor competition. So, um, you know, we try to stay with one category if possible. A very important topic to tackle though is analgesia and unfortunately the majority of the anesthetics that we use do not have analgesic properties analgesics treat pain so if you have pain you want to give an analgesic but you know so like for example when i give an animal ace promazine they look very sleepy and they look very comfortable but I promise you, if you go to grab that dog to try and take an x-ray or pull its leg to take a film of its stifle, um, they can react. So they can look, you know, so there, there's, you know, acepromazine is a very common sedative that a lot of clinics use. And it, it's a great drug. I love acepromazine. But the problem is if I'm going to use it for an animal that's painful, I need to give something with, I might use ACE and butorphanol, or like at Purdue, our number one pre-med was ACE and morphine. Like almost every patient got ACE and morphine. So you have to realize that if we're gonna do, you know, general anesthesia just keeps them asleep, but it doesn't, like isoflurane has no analgesia. Um, and, you know, like, uh, Valium does not have any analgesia. Acepromazine, no analgesia. So anytime you have a drug protocol, the best thing is to treat the pain before it starts. I'm going to talk about something called preemptive analgesia. Well, let me give you an analogy. Say you were going to get a headache at 4 o'clock, like a raging headache, and you could take Advil at 3.30. Wouldn't that be amazing? Like you wouldn't even maybe get the headache. Well, if I know we're going to put a blade on a dog's belly at 9 a.m. for a spay, why don't I give it some pain meds at 8.30? So that, because I will tell you, if you wait to see if an animal's going to be painful, by the time they feel pain and then you treat their pain, there's something called wind up and the pain is like, you almost have to double your dose. Like they're going to need much more pain medication. If you start before the pain starts and then maintain an, a, you know, a, an interval, a dosing interval, then you can control their pain and you can use less drug and the patient feels more comfortable. You know, now if a trauma comes in, like if a dog's hit by car and their femur's split in two, I mean, they come in painful. There's nothing I can do about that. But when we do elective surgery, like when, an, when a spay walks in the door or castration, they're not painful when they walk in. So give them an analgesic in the pre-med, they're going to be much better pain controlled. So you'll hear me preach on this a uh, bit. Um, now, usually in our pre-med protocols, we usually use more than one drug. Um, you do have to be careful. Now, for example, this is a little tip, and I may, I think I talked about this. When you guys do your dextomator butorphanol for radiology, you will draw up dextomator separate, butorphanol separate. They will be checked, and once they're verified, 
then you're going to mix them in one syringe because you don't want to give a dog two injections. But those drugs are compatible. We know that you can mix them, um, but we have to look for something called precipitate. If you, so sometimes if you mix incompatible drugs, like by accident, if you pick up your syringe and shake it, it, it does look like a snow globe because what happens, that's called precipitate. It makes like these little snowflake type things. So a lot of times if a drug's been sitting in a syringe, sometimes I just pick it up and shake it. And if it looks clear, it shouldn't be cloudy. Um, especially if you're gonna go IV. If something's cloudy, you gotta be really cautious if you're going intravenous. Um, but if you mix two drugs and you start to see the cloudiness or you start to see that, you may have to check. But for the most part, most of our anesthetics and our adjunct agents are water soluble. They're, they're water-based drugs, except for one key drug that you use a lot, which is called diazepam. Diazepam is in a, it's called, it's like a propylene glycol base. When I drop Valium, it almost looks, I don't wanna say syrupy, it's not as thick as syrup, but it's a little bit thicker than like most of your injectables that kind of look like water. So Valium has a little bit of a color tinge. It's maybe like slightly amber colored. It's not. Um, so the two things is you have, the only thing you can mix with diazepam is ketamine. Ketamine diazepam can go together. They do not precipitate, but anything else, di if you did like diazepam butorphanol, you would have to do separate syringes because they're not compatible in the same syringe. So I will highlight that about certain drugs um, that you don't want to do that. Um, hang on one second. Let me mention something else about drug, drug combos and I'll, I'll give you guys another, you know I like analogies. Um, there are some, sometimes, doctors and certain sometimes certain texts um and this is a va very older thinking um they don't want to give an animal a lot of drugs you know they're like let's just give it one drug because we're giving too many drugs um i talk about anesthesia like soup and i think i maybe said this but i'm gonna say it one more time real quick um if you make a pot of soup and you're like i'm just gonna use salt well, in order to make the soup flavorful, you're probably going to use a lot of salt, except salt is not good for people that have high blood pressure or if they have heart disease. And, you know, it's recommended to decrease your salt. How do you decrease your salt? Let's add some garlic. Let's add some pepper. Let's maybe add some thyme and rosemary. Now, by adding all these different spices, I can decrease the amount of salt that I can put in my soup, which decreases the offensive ingredient or the ingredient that has the most side effects. You know, if you're making soup for your grandma that has heart disease, you gotta watch how much salt you put in it, but you want it to taste good, right? If I decide to give a dog just ace promazine, because I don't wanna give it anything else, if I want to achieve sedation, I'm gonna have to use a much higher dose of ace promazine. Well, ace promazine, has some very decent side effects. Now, I don't mean decent good, I mean there are side effects to ace promazine. If I give some butorphanol with it, they enhance each other. It's called synergistic, it's one of the terms on your homework sheet. But when two drugs work together, they work synergistically. They enhance each other's good things, and then they also allow you to use less of each one, and so you get less of the bad effects. So I don't want you to get of this thinking like, oh my God, we're giving our patient too many drugs. You know, kitty magic is dextomator, ketamine, butorphanol, and sometimes people are like, oh, you're giving this cat three medications. Well, one is the anesthetic, one is the sedative, one is the analgesic, and they all enhance each other, and it works very well. But if I just gave a cat ketamine by itself, I'm gonna be using a lot of ketamine. And ketamine also has quite a bit of side effects that I don't like. So if I can decrease my ketamine by adding these other agents, then you get, like I said, you get this synergism. 
you get them working together and then you can decrease their side. So you'll hear me preach that. Um, and again, that's an older kind of thinking, you know, so we'll do these, what are called balanced protocols, um, where you'll use multiple drugs. But again, I'm not, I'm not trying to gork my patient, but by using multiple agents, you use less of each agent and you, a lot of times they enhance each other and that's kind of what you want. Um, to review, and you probably talk about this in pharmacology, um, there's some of the anesthetics are controlled substances, not all of them. Um, and there are the five schedules. Um, DEA is, you know, who we report to in the United States. So um, they have to be inventoried every two years. Um, and you have to control, you know, have a controlled drug log. Um, you are allowed, <clears throat> well, and let me tell you, there is more restrictions if you have a Schedule II versus a Schedule IV drug. Um, if you remember, Schedule I are like street drugs, heroin, cocaine. Okay, we're, we're, we don't have the, uh, the, the highest abuse schedule we start with is schedule two which is like morphine and fentanyl and then when we get into schedule three that's like buprenorphine and schedule four is butorphanol so as you go as the number goes higher the chance for abuse goes lower i'll give you an example and, and then ketamine is a schedule three but nobody is breaking in your clinic for butorphanol and if they do they're extremely stupid Okay, because butorphanol does not have the effects that people are looking for. They might be looking for ketamine, they might be looking for morphine. Um, and because they have a higher abuse potential, that's they have the stricter record, record keeping. In general, um, you know, they have to be stored usually in a locked cabinet, um, usually behind two locks. Our, our cabinet at VCA has one door, it's bolted to the wall, um, but it has two codes. And to get into the cabinet, you have to put in both codes. Now, and also like on an ER shift at VCA, only one person has the code. There might be five of us working a shift, five techs. Anytime we needed a control drugs, we had to go to one technician. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but you know, they don't, the more people you have getting into a drug cabinet, A, you have more of a potential for abuse or loss. I mean, you know, if one person is keeping track of all the drugs, it's going to be easier to find mistakes. I mean, errors happen. It, it you know, it's human error. Um, sometimes some drugs get like, squirted out by accident but you know if you have significant loss like all of a sudden you can't account for four mils of morphine that's significant and it has to be reported i will tell you that and some people are not good about this do yourself a favor a lot of techs that get hired out of practice you get put in charge of the drug box you really should check it daily because if you say, oh, I'll check it on Friday, you know, it's Monday and you're like, eh, I'll just do it Friday. If you have loss, then you're going to have to go through all the whole last week of cases. If you're doing it daily, you're going to pick up on like little errors and it's going to be easier to find, you know, you might do five, seven surgeries a day. So by the time you get to the end of the week, you might have 35 to 40 surgeries that you'd have to go through all those records and go back through and find your loss. You can be 10% off. So if you have a 10 mil bottle of morphine and you can only account for nine mils, you know, cause 10% is one mil. So if you can total your book and you have nine mils recorded, you know, that's considered reasonable loss. Like the hub accounts for some, um, sometimes it a little bit squirts out when you're drawing it up and that can be an accident, you know, but any more than 10% off, especially in high abuse drugs, you have to be careful. Um, and one thing I'll tell you really quick about this. Um, we, when I was up in Anderson, they, they caught an ER girl getting into the drug box. Well, they started watching because what we started finding 
and this is unfortunate, we were get now when I give a dog morphine, they will almost puke immediately. And then sometimes they defecate and sometimes they start panting. Well, we were given our dogs morphine as a pre-med, no puking, no panting, no relaxing. And I was like, you know, what's wrong with our morphine? Because these dogs and someone was acting weird at the clinic and they put her under observation. Um, she had pulled out the morphine and replaced it with saline. So took the morphine out of the bottle. So when we would go to give, you know, and morphine's clear. So when you look at the bottle, you know, we looked at it and you couldn't tell, but our patients were not going to sleep, which I think is really crappy to steal patient. You know, now I'm giving dog a drug for pain and it's not working. Um, but she was put under observation. Now, I don't know, you know, I was, she was an ER tech. I know, you know, I mean, she was let go, but I don't know, you know, if they ended up pressing charges, but you know, <laughs> It's an unfortunate thing. You have to be very cautious. Watch it very closely. Um, so the other thing too is we also lock up our um, some doctors if they have a you know what's called a controlled drug prescription pad. It often has their DEA number on it so that they can prescribe controlled substances. Um, you know we also kept that locked up because. You know, if it was in a drawer and somebody can write themselves, you know, a prescription, um, we had to be cautious of that as well. So, um, so that's kind of all of the maybe kind of general stuff about pre-meds. Um, do you have any questions about anything I said? <laughs> 